So I think you all know what a sunflower is supposed to look like, right? There are these beautiful, open, tall flowers, very bright yellow. Um, but sometimes when they're void of water, they can also look like the painting I show you here. This is a Van Gogh painting uh, and he painted two cut off sunflowers. And as you can see, they are not these beautiful open flowers anymore. And I think we all know that plants respond to droughts. Um, and my name is Alco van der Waarde. And today I will talk, uh, I will tell you about how the plants uh, in Europe responded to the drought of 2022. And as I heard, it's the last uh, talk of this year. It's only fitting to talk, uh, talk about this year, but I will do that. Uh, uh, I will talk about this drought by contrasting it to the uh, previous very strong drought, which was in 2018. Yeah, so again, I show you here the, the SPEI, which is a measure of how dry it was. And to understand it, um, zero means a normal year. So that would be gray in this figure. However, we see a lot of red in 2018, which means a dry year. Here, there's also some, uh, some qualifications. So a SPEI of minus 1.3 is a severe drought and my, uh, everything smaller than two is an exceptional drought. And we see that in 2018 in large parts of Scandinavia, also in the Netherlands, in Germany as well. And we can contrast this by the drought of this year of 2022. We see in uh, 2022 that the droughts mainly struck the southern part of Europe, so mainly Spain, France, but again it struck the Netherlands and Germany. So these areas are hit twice and I will, uh, I will come back to that. So now you, you know it has been dry and you know where it has been dry, but how did the plants respond? And we can get a very nice overview from the, the near V, which is the near infrared reflectance of vegetation. And this is an, a measure of how open the plants are, how much their leaves are faced towards the sun, which is in turn a measure for how much photosynthesis they can do. And this is an anomaly. So this is how much the near V differed from normal years. Normal years here would be zero. And in the blue, in the positive, there are, well, there's the sunflower again. Uh, this means happy plants, a higher near V than normal. So more open leaves, more faced towards the sun. On the other end, in the, the central parts of Europe, you see the, the red colors, which indicates lower GPP. So, uh, so sorry, lower near V. Uh, going hand in hand with lower GPP, lower photosynthetic rates, and lower carbon uptake over Europe. What's quite nice to see here as well is that in the, the Spain part, uh, in the very southwest of Europe, we don't see that strong of a near V response. But there was a very strong drought response. As you remember, the uh, SPEI index here was the lowest of all Europe. It was minus 1.3, which was severe drought. And we think this is because the plants in Spain are already used to drought a bit more. And uh, the crops there are harvested at different times than, uh, than in the rest of Europe. So the biosphere is more adjusted already to drought. This is, of course, only just a proxy. This is a spatial observed pattern. And although informative, it doesn't tell us anything about how much carbon was exchanged. And to show you that, I show you here a, a measurement from a south a site in the south of France. This is the below site. And this is the NEP, the Net Ecosystem Productivity, with emissions, uh, if it's above zero, so that it means fluxes from the ground into the atmosphere. And if it's below zero, there is uptake, which means 
carbon uptake from the atmosphere into the ecosystem. And I show you here in blue the, the climatology, which is 2014 to 2017. So that's four years of data. And in the blue shading, there's the standard deviation. If we go to the previous drought we've had, which was 2018, you see that, well, this site didn't respond uh, very anomalously, although there was in May and July, May, June, July, an enhanced spring uptake. And I will come back to that, uh, why we think that is. Then in July, we see a very strong response of the droughts going from an enhanced uptake to a reduced uptake, even getting, uh, getting into emissions for this uh, forest site in the, in the south of France. However, when we look at 2022, we see an even stronger response. We see a very strong spring uptake, uh, starting from, uh, well, let's say March and uh, April, then in May, it is very anomalous even, but then the drought hits and the ecosystem becomes quite a big source of CO2. So this means at this time from, let's say, July onwards, June, July onwards, this site has not taken up CO2 anymore, but has emitted it into the atmosphere. And this is only for one site, of course. And this could be an extreme case because it's a forest site. So we have analyzed this uh, in the model world for 2018 uh, with a spring enhancement. Well, I told you, uh, told you about that. And summer reduction, as I've also told you, uh, in the 2018 droughts in the northern hemisphere, in the northern parts of Europe. And we found that there was a 55 teragram of C spring enhancement, so more uptake by the biosphere. But then when a drought struck, there was a 68 teragram C summer reduction. And these are, of course, this is a very important change in the timing of the CO2 uptake of the biosphere. And well, we researched this with, uh, as I said, in, uh, in 2020 or sorry, for the 2018 drought. But we were only able to publish this in 2020 because it took us a long time to gather all data, to run all models, to intertwine everything together to come to these results. And also other, uh, other studies that were also po uh, powered by ICOS data, uh, which I didn't tell yet about the, the Smith et al paper, but we used here ICOS data, which was available. And then we realized if the ICOS data is available, why do the models take so long to become available? And that's why we created a near real time uh, CO2 estimate over Europe. And in this model, which we call CTEHR, Carbon Tracker Europe High Resolution, um, we have near real-time uh, estimates for the biosphere emissions and uptake, for anthropogenic emissions, for fire, wildfire emissions, and the ocean fluxes. And as you see here on the right-hand side, we have the anthropogenic emissions uh, for a day in August, a randomly chosen day in August of this year. And you see here as well the high resolution of our product pack. You see. Uh, for example, shipping lanes and those, uh, those things. And we can make these fluxes two, mo two months behind near real time for all these different uh, flux fields. So for the biosphere, for anthropogenic fluxes, the fire and the ocean. We've also made this as a at a high resolution to be able to study the, the carbon fluxes uh, at a regional level as well. And then, in just a bit more detail. And with these fluxes, we wanted to provide people uh, prior emissions for atmospheric modeling to see uh, what the carbon 
budget was doing over Europe. But we can use these fluxes now, of course, also to get a first estimate of what the European carbon budget did, for example, over this year. And although I am here today to talk about the droughts of this year, I will also very shortly show you the, a part of the anthropogenic emissions because the droughts is not a, the only thing happening this year. There was also uh, the Ukraine crisis, of course, the gas crisis. And because of this gas crisis, uh, gas became very expensive. And we in the Netherlands and also Germany and other economies in Europe use gas for their public power generation. Because gas was so expensive, we switched back to, uh, to coal, as you see here in these, uh, uh, these headlines of uh, some, uh, some websites here. And we see this as well in our anthropogenic emissions. So I show you here the uh, emissions from the public power sector separated by fuel relative to 2021, which was previous year, of course. So in 2021, everything is one because it's normalized to that year. As you can see, we reduced our coal emissions because they are burn more dirty, they emit more CO2 per unit of, uh, of generated public power. And to get to our climate goals, we reduced our coal emissions very nicely. Um, but to still provide the, the public power we have, we are also increasing our gas emissions. This trend continues up until 2021. Um, 2020, of course, is a COVID year in which we generated less electricity because uh, companies were out of, uh, uh, were, were not running. So we just produced a bit of, little bit of less electricity. Then in 2021, we started using more coal again and less gas. Uh, note here that because coal burns uh, a bit dirtier than gas, the total CO2 emissions were about the same, uh, but I don't show you that. Either. Okay, so that was our little segue into the, the anthropogenic emissions. Let's go back to the, the drought response, because that is, of course, the, the main topic of my, uh, my talk here. And to really appreciate uh, what I'm going to show you, I will tell you first what we did to get to this, uh, this drought response, this biosphere module in our CTE HR system. We used uh, the SIP4 biosphere model. That is a, uh, just a computer model that takes in meteorology. We take that from the ERA-5 model and calculates then based on, for example, incoming solar radiation, uh, temperature, precipitation. It calculates the CO2 exchange between different pools. So we have leaves, we have stems, uh, we have different pools in the ground, different carbon pools. And based on the weather patterns, uh, the biosphere model sees, it exchanges between these pools. And it calculates this, this exchange at half by half degree grid cells, which is somewhere in the order of, let's say, 50 by 50 kilometers, maybe a bit more. And um, it does this for every plant functional type. So for every dominant uh, type of plants in that grid cell. And we then downscaled this, this, uh, this half by half degree fluxes based on the land use type, because we know very precisely where different land covers are, up to two kilometers even. And we see that um, flux patterns change 
more abruptly with change in land cover over small distances than with, uh, with the very small changes in weather that you have on the kilometer scale. And so that's how we get to a 0 0.2 by 0 0.1 degree resolution uh, flux model for the biosphere. Question is, of course, can we trust this one? Can we trust this biosphere model? And to show you that, I'll take you back to the near V, this proxy for how well plants were doing, how much photosynthesis they could do because of how their leaves were, were structured, how their phonology is. And I'll show you here on the left hand side, the near V anomaly for 2018. Um, this is the July anomaly. So we see here that the drought struck in the center and the north. And we see exactly the same pattern in the calculated GPP, which is the photosynthesis by the SID model. And to really appreciate this, you have to notice as well that these are two independent data sets. They have not seen any information of each other because the near V on the left hand side is a satellite product. And on the right hand side, you see what we have calculated. And this gives us quite some confidence in our biosphere model in this upscaled SIP4. We've also done some validation in Smith et al, the 2020 paper I already talked about. And in the Van der Waude et al paper, which is stir, uh, currently in the, in the review. We are also doing a validation for 2022, um, and that is still ongoing. So now we know what we have. We have this biosphere model. Let's talk about some droughts. And um, in the remainder of the talk, I will show you the results for the drought area. And the drought area here is where the SPEI in that given year is smaller than minus 1.5, which is quite a severe drought. For 2018, again, that was mainly the north. For 2022, it was the south. And we see that the areas are quite comparable, um, which makes it easy to compare these two droughts in strength of the response as well. In purple, you see where both areas are, uh, or where both droughts were, uh, have struck. So both 2018 and 2022. And this also already gives a sort of natural distribution into three different categories. So we have the north, only struck once, the center struck twice, and the south struck once. I've made a four region distribution um, because the east uh, is very interesting as well. So I've split up the 2022 drought into two regions. <clears throat> Because in the East, uh, we don't have that much measurements. Uh, we, we don't know much about it yet. Whereas in the South, we have uh, a little bit more measurements. And in the South, there are also not that much plants as I've already shown you in the near V figure uh, in the beginning. So what do we see over this drought area? I show you here the anomaly again of the net ecosystem productivity. So the total ecosystem under the drought area, which is here, the red area has taken up. And if it's above zero, it's a lower uptake, below zero, a higher uptake. And what you see very interesting in May, we have an enhanced uptake, the enhanced spring uptake that we've also talked about in the, the Smith, Smith et al paper. And then here in June, uh, June, July, there is a very strong response to negative, uh, to a positive anomaly, sorry, a lower uptake. And I show you this because in 2022, we have not seen this similar response. In 2022, we have a 
decreased uptake from April onwards, but not as strong of a drought response in, for example, July. In both droughts, we see a fall enhancement or more uptake in fall. But that is, of course, still happening. So we, I'm not going to uh, talk about that too much. But the question is, can we explain these differences uh, in this drought? So let's first look at this enhanced spring uptake that we see for, uh, for 2018. And I'll show you here on the left side, the temperature anomaly for the entire uh, drought region, the uh, red area again. And as you can see here in February, March, it was quite cold. It was three degrees, two or three degrees colder than normal. But in March and April, temperatures rose. And that's also what we see for, for a drought. Usually it's preceded by a long period of fair weather of nice temperatures, more sunlight, um, just good uh, conditions for plants to grow in. And that's also what we see here on the right hand side. We see an enhanced uptake in the spring. But then temperatures are still just a bit higher than normal in uh, June, July. But there's this very strong drought response, as I show you here as well. And how can we explain that? And to really understand what is happening there, we have to know as well how plants respond to drought, what they do, uh, what, they, what they do at the leaf level even. And in SIP4, that's calculated by different stresses on the photosynthesis that a plant can do. I'll show you that here on the, on the left-hand side. A lower value means more stress. So this is a reduction of GPP, of the photosynthesis. If it's higher, then there is less stress. I'll show you here the VPD stress, the vapor pressure deficit stress. This is a measure of how much moist was in the air. And maybe you know this as well. Um, in greenhouses where temperatures are high, farmers try to keep the, the air very moist. So plants do not experience, or plants' leaves do not experience a drought. Because if the air is very dry, and uh, then they try to conserve the water by not opening their stomata, by sort of not breathing, because they're afraid they're losing too much water. In 2018, where this, uh, this graph is formed, we see the climatology in, uh, in gray and in red, the stress that is experienced over the drought area, the average stress. And what you see here is that in April, May, June even, the stress, the, at least the relative humidity stress, is very much within the climatology. Nothing major is happening. Then in July and August, the red graph goes quite well below the gray area, the climatology, what a normal year would look like. And this indicates that there, the plants experience a stronger stress than normal, which, could, which would reduce how much they take up relative to normal years, of course. But this doesn't show us this very, very strong response in, uh, in July. It shows us more, indeed, more stress. But it doesn't explain really why this is so strong. And to understand that, we will look at a different stress, the soil moisture stress. And as you see here, that strikes quite severely. And again, in the gray area is what a normal year would look like. And in the red area is the stress for 2018. You see, stresses are quite, the soil moisture stress is quite normal. 
up until let's say July, when it becomes really, really strong, it passes this sort of threshold. And maybe you know this as well from um, the plants in your living room. You water them or you forget to water them and they, they seem fine. Up until one day when they, when they all of a sudden seem completely dry. And this, this sort of threshold that is reached, we think we see that as well in 2018, this very strong response, which in the end explains then why we see this lower uptake all of a sudden in 2018. So now we can explain what we see. We see enhanced uptake because of higher temperatures, often paired with more sunlight. I didn't show you that here. Um, and there was still enough water. Plants were not stressed yet. Then water levels in the soil reach a certain threshold and plants start to experience stress. But we do not see this for 2022. We see a reduction from the start on, from April, May onwards, and not as strong of a response in, let's say, July. So how can we explain that? And to show you, to understand that, I show you here the, the stresses again that I just told you about over the center area of Europe, <clears throat> which is this area which is struck twice by, uh, by the drought. And you see on the left-hand side, the soil moisture stress again, a uh, very strong response in 2018, the red bar, red graph, in uh, June, July. And in 2020, the soil moisture response is not that strong. It's for starters a month later, uh, it starts to reach this very strong threshold. And it is never stronger than the VPD response, than the how dry the leaves think it is, which I show you on the right hand side. On the right hand side, you also see also this relative humidity stress, this leaf humidity stress is not really below a normal year for 2022. So we don't expect a very strong drought response here. So how can we then still explain this anomaly, this lower uptake? And to show you that, oh, sorry. Uh, interestingly, these findings are not also uh, not only found in our SIP4 model, which is of, this is of course a result from, but this is also found uh, at eddy covariance sites that are struck twice by the drought. We see a very strong soil moisture limitation in 2018 and a very strong relative humidity uh, limitation in 2022. And I have to, uh, to credit uh, the French INRAI here uh, and the IGOS data, of course, which is used to do this analysis. And we are uh, working on a, on a publication about this. So keep your, uh, keep your heads up. But again, with just these stresses in the center of Europe in the twice struck region, we cannot explain the response we see. Because, for example, we don't see a stronger response than 2018 in any of the stresses. And to understand what, what, is, what has happened over Europe, I will introduce a sort of new region. Uh, of course, it's not new because it has already been there. But it's a new region in the sense that it has not been observed that much yet. And we can see that very nicely. In, uh, in some graphs that Ida Storm, who is also present here, I think, uh, has prepared. Uh, this is for her paper. And we see, for example, in the east of Europe, we see, well, brown and green colors on the land use map that I show you here, which means there is lots of croplands and lots of broadleaf forests. And these broadleaf forests are very important because they take up a lot of CO2 generally. They are very active. 
I show you on the right hand side in the green, bra uh, green plot the monitoring potential. And this is a measure for how much of, in this case, the broadleaf forest flux we actually do not see in the current measurement network that we have. And as you see here, for the east, we still miss a lot of this forest flux. So currently, we're not observing it that well. Thankfully, we have satellite products that don't care where you place your station because they observe everything. And I again show you here the near V, the near infrared reflectance of vegetation, with again a positive number here, meaning more happy plants, bigger leaves, more face towards the sun, and a negative value, meaning less, uh, less happy plants, because again, this is an anomaly plot. So zero would be a normal year. And we see here that from March onwards, the near V has been quite negative, or the near V anomaly, sorry. This indicates that these plants in the eastern region of Europe experienced a drought from May onwards. And that's also what we saw in the total European drought response, right? And reduced uptake from the spring onwards. And we also see that in our biosphere model in SIP4. We see from March, April onwards, we see a lower uptake in at least this eastern region. So why is this? Uh, well, we can't validate that, uh, unfortunately. But of course, our SIP4 model has shown us quite nice results, which we trust. And we see very strong relative humidity stress over this eastern region. So here, the plants, leaves think it's very dry, but the soil doesn't yet think it's dry. Where does this leave us? Um, currently, over the drought area, the biosphere took up about 55 teragrams of C less. This, this is a bit stronger than 2018. And that's mainly because, of, uh, because we didn't see the enhanced spring uptake this year. We started with a reduced uptake, which we have seen through the entire season. <clears throat> I've also shown you that the eastern part of Europe is a quite important uh, area. However, it's not observed, so it's hard to, uh, to draw conclusions from that part. And uh, there's two things I didn't really talk about, uh, which is the fall enhancement, which, well, at least here in the Netherlands, uh, is still happening, we think, because it's still relatively warm. Uh, most trees still even have leaves, whereas normally they would drop already from, uh, from October onwards. And you see this as well in the drop-off on the right-hand side of this graph. There, the total any uh, total ecosystem productivity anomaly reduces a bit. It goes back. So that means plants take up more than normal. I've also not really talked about fires um, because it was not really the, the scope of this talk. But we do see that fires are more intense in 2022 than in 2018. And we are researching that with uh, the group of Philip Sia, who is analyzing this, uh, the intensity of the fires. I want to end on the note uh, that this is only one model and this is still all preliminary data, but that we are uh, doing research here in more depth about this drought response. So thank you all for, uh, for listening. If you're interested in the fluxes, they are uh, available at the ICOS Carbon portal. Uh, you can scan either this QR code or click the link uh, in the slides that will be made available after this presentation. Thank you very much for listening. If there is any questions, feel free to ask them.
Thank you very much um, okay, for this very interesting talk. Um, yes, so uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or raise your hand and um, we can ask them directly here uh, to Auke. Um, and maybe I can start with one. I was just wondering, um, you had many um, plots uh, where you take five, six years, the last five, six years as a reference point. I guess you have averaged those and uh, then you create the, the zero point for your plots. So uh, I was just wondering uh, what the reason is behind this, why you chose those last uh, five, six years. Um, because my guess would be that if you would look at the last 50 years, let's say uh, the response for the drought would be much more extreme compared uh, than just the last five years. Um, can, could you elaborate on that maybe? Yes, that's actually a very good question. Uh, thank you. So uh, you are right. We only take uh, from 2016 onwards. And that, yeah, that, that is a choice we made because we provide the flexes only from 2016 onwards because the, the land use map we use uses the data from 2015. And although we could go back in time uh, even more, uh, we would not be certain about the, the, the land cover that we use for, the, for making it a higher resolution. And indeed, this does influence our uh, results because not only 2018 was dry, but also 2019 was relatively dry and even 2020 was relatively dry. And this also shows that maybe taking the last 50 years might not be representative for what we are seeing in the past, let's say, 10 years. Maybe the droughts are becoming the new normal, in which 2018 and 2022 are still very extreme. So did this answer your question? Yes, uh, very much. Thank you, so. And I was just told that uh, I had the wrong microphone, so probably you did not hear me properly <laughs> when I was talking. Sorry about that. No, but thank you very much. Okay. Um, is there um, any other um, questions from the audience? I uh, don't see at the moment. Uh, Matthias, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Alfred, for okay, for the talk. Uh, I I might I might have somehow missed it, but did you tell why we have an an enhanced or a lower uptake in the beginning of the year, two thousand twenty-two? You somehow then in, in the central region then jump to the other region. So I ah sure, yeah yeah I was <laughs> um, yeah so what we saw in uh, 2018 was that um, the, the soil was still very wet, but the, the atmosphere was quite good for plants. So there was a higher temperature, um, which made the plants um, do more photosynthesis, at least in the center part and the northern part. In the eastern part, Plants were limited by the vapor pressure, so by how humid the air is, already from March onwards. And indeed, I did not really uh, go into too much depth about that. Um, but we, we know it's, um, it has been quite warm and dry there from that period onwards. And the uh, plants there are more limited by the, how humid the air is than how humid the soil is. And that is what we think makes this difference between these two droughts. Is that clear? Does that answer the, answer the question? Uh, you, you, you said uh, the eastern part again. Uh, are we talking about the central, the zone which we see here on the graph? So like this blue line. Ah. So why, why is the blue line 
above normal in ah, sorry. Yeah, April, sorry. April yeah. to June. Yeah, I, I then misunderstood. I'm sorry. Um, so this blue line is integrated over the entire area, uh, over the entire blue area that you see on the, the right hand side. Okay. You do see in the center, indeed, a enhanced spring uptake, but that's smaller than the reduction in the eastern part. So the eastern part is just more important here, or the reduction in the eastern part is trumps the enhanced uptake in the central parts of Europe. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Walter, please go ahead. You have raised your hand. Yes, thank you, uh, Alko. We are here with uh, a whole uh, fan group uh, watching your presentation. Uh, so, so just to follow up on your uh, on your answer, I think the um, the special thing about this 2018 uh, spring situation was also, of course, um, the location of the drought uh, or the the location of the anomaly. In this case, the spring one was a, a warm anomaly. And I think especially this northerly uh, region being uh, hit by extremely warm temperatures uh, is, is different because it's such a temperature limited region, especially in spring. So really the, March, the months of March, April, May are very, uh, the temperature is a very deciding factor on what happens to the, to the spring um, uptake and to the spring vegetation. If you look at, for example, um, Southern Europe, the Mediterranean region. It's not at all strongly temperature limited and they typically already in March, April, May have uh, nice weather and good conditions for growth um, and a few degrees extra temperature or a little bit of extra sunshine, sunshine doesn't uh, define the success of their uh, spring uptake basically. What I wanted to ask you is if you can say a little bit more about the uh, the ICOS measurements, because you started your presentation saying it's great that these data are now available in uh, in near real time and the, the, our models are falling behind and we have to work on it. Uh, and then you went into a long story about the models. Um, but can you say a bit more about what we're seeing from the atmosphere and from the biosphere um, also in relation to your model results? Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, that's a, That's a very good question because um, it also does provide me the opportunity to tell a bit more about this. Um, I did not make uh, make backup slides for this, so I have to um, to do it by uh, by heart. What we see for the, um, let's start with the atmosphere. What we see for the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere is that the southern sites that we have, the southern CO2 measurement sites, show higher CO2 concentrations than normal years. And that means the uptake was less, of course, and these, these sites already see that the Europe has taken up less CO2. In the, we see a very nice gradient actually from south to north uh, with the south having reduced or yeah, so enhanced uh, CO2 in, uh, concentrations, which decreases to the north. So the north doesn't see this very, uh, this enhanced CO2 concentrations, which also coincides of course with the location of the drought, which was mainly in the south. For the ecosystem measurements, um, so the, the eddy covariance sites we see that we have, we see very similar things to what the, the SIP model does actually. So we see reduced uh, NEE to the point some sites even become uh, sources as I showed you, for example, for below. And we also see a reduction in the latent heat, which is the, the, the water flux, the, the moisture flux in the air, which shows that plants also respire less. So plants have really closed their stomata and stopped uh, exchanging with the atmosphere. Does that answer your question, Walter? Yes, no, thanks. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's important to know indeed uh, that the, uh, the ICOS network is picking up very similar signals. And um, 
Well, we've, um, we've of course also looked a little bit already at uh, soil moisture analysis, which is difficult because you only have measurements in the topsoil and it doesn't represent the whole profile except for a few sites, but those were not the hardest hit. Um, but I think this storyline of, um, of the 2020 drought being one uh, driven much more strongly by VPD stress than by soil moisture stress, and therefore uh, showing a, a different response from the northerly eco regions in 2018. Um, that's, a, that's a nice developing story, I think, also from the, uh, the observational uh, side of this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have um, Maggie, please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Avka, for a very interesting presentation. Also for a non-expert like myself, I think I, I learned quite a lot of uh, new things. And, and also it made me reflect on, on how important it is not only to have uh, data on uh, say concentrations or soil moisture or whatever, but also to really understand and uh, fold into the whole story, the knowledge about how plants behave and, and uh, what their mechanisms are, so to speak. Um, I guess my question is, um, apart, so, so you already touched upon uh, you and also Wouter about uh, that maybe we didn't have uh, all the data about what's happening in the soil, uh, deep down in the soil and not having a comprehensive set of information there makes it a little bit more difficult to disentangle different effects here. But uh, if in a perfect world, what, what other types of observational data would you have liked to have had during the, the access to during this whole uh, work of yours? Where, where are we missing out? Not only by not having stations at all, like in Eastern Europe, but, but, but should we be adding more uh, variables to our um, palette of observations? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you very much. Um, so indeed, um, the, the location is very important of the measurements. Um, but as Wouter also said, we lack soil moisture observations at some locations. They are also not really that standardized as I've understood. Um, so there's different levels, different depths of these soil moisture uh, measurements. But what we could also do, for example, is take a look at different uh, isotopes. So we know that C13, which is a, uh, a stable isotope of uh, carbon, that responds differently um, to different droughts. So uh, uh, that could be used as a tracer to understand what is happening uh, as well and where it's happening, uh, the droughts and what plants are doing. So I think um, isotopes are would be a very useful addition and more soil moisture measurements and more locations. 